That's right. So, yeah, when Einstein got the Nobel Prize in, in 1922, the Nobel Committee made it very, very clear it was not for his work on, on space time, so special and general relativity. They, they didn't, I think they were suspicious of it. I mean, and it took a while for it to be accepted. And, but, but eventually later it was accepted because it, you know, it really was a, a major advance over Newton's theory of gravity and space, space and time. And it, my take is that Right. Space time is doomed, you know, came out in 2000, maybe before, but at least 2005 with David Gross's paper. And in 2013, what you're referring to was the Nimar, Kani Hamed and, and Yaroslav Trinka published something called the Amplitudehedron, which was in some sense a, a first real deep structure beyond space time that was actually able to compute scattering amplitudes inside space-time. So it was, the, mm -hmm. it was the first successful foray beyond space-time to find new structures. That was what happened in 2013. Wow. So, but yeah, you're right. Most quantum physicists don't know. They haven't heard about the amplitude hedron. They don't know about this. But I'm quite confident, you know, science is conservative, but it, it, it will progress. It always does. It, it just takes time. Usually, the old guard has to die, and it's the younger generation that picks up the new theories and runs with them. And that's so. That's what what happens, and I, I think it, you know within thirty years, forty years, it will be you know just of, of, it would be of course you know space time isn't mm. fundamental, and I think also um, a generation that's raised spending a fair fraction of their time in v virtual reality oh, is going to yeah. have no trouble with this. In fact, they're going to look back on us as the old fuddy duds. Who just yes. how could they how could they it's like we look back, back at the flat earth people how in the world could they i mean i i, I sort of get you know the earth looks a little bit flat but how could you be so stupid is sort of how we feel about it yeah. now yeah and i think that that's the way it's going to be you know they'll the people who spend their time in vr will look back and go how in the world could you possibly have taken this as the fundamental reality that's just so stupid yeah so, so i think yeah it'll, it'll be accepted and, and we'll actually look like fuddy duds yeah Okay, so virtual reality, you know, actual virtual reality headsets are, are going to be helping us out, which is, um, or, or helping this this view of things, view of reality to progress and be more widely accepted. That's quite a nice little thought. Gives me a new view of virtual reality. Um, now, just quickly as well, we haven't, so I touched on um, the, mm. the hard problem of consciousness earlier. Now, this is all obviously linked, but again, just to come back to that. So most people assume that there are such things as brains, and according to how we've been discussing, no, the brains are how we see something that is infinitely more complex. I remember Bernardo talking about, you know, brains are how we see our internal experience from a second person point of view. So you look at a brain and it looks like a brain, but my experience of it would be thoughts and feelings and perceptions and all those kind of things. Um, but yet this is another one, isn't it? That the, the ma vast majority of, of physics, of, um, People working in physics, top people who work in physics, I can't remember the word, um, you know, are still utterly convinced that conscious experience, the taste of chocolate, the feeling of love, et cetera, et cetera, is created by the brain. Now, mm -hmm. as we've established, that can't be true according to what you're saying. So that's part number one, just briefly on that. And then secondly, when's that going to get? When do you predict that will become um, you know, again, looked at as fuddy duddy view. R right. So, most of my my friends and colleagues who are studying consciousness and cognitive neuroscience and related fields <clears throat> uh, assume that something inside space time, like the brain, is the source of consciousness. You have to have the right complicated systems with right integrated information, proper properties, or uh, the right uh, orchestrated collapse of microtubule quantum state properties, or or, or whatever it might be, um, the, the right global workspace um, state or, or properties. Somehow these functional properties of physical systems um, give rise to consciousness. And I, I think that, that most of my colleagues think that partly because they don't understand that space time is doomed. But again, most physicists don't yet understand that space time is doomed. So I can't, you know, I can't fault my, yeah, my nah. colleagues. In cognitive neuroscience, for not knowing that, so so they, they don't understand that the the bottom has been cut out from that whole thing. Um, and by the way, you know, last December, the Nobel Prize went to three physicists um, who 
who together did the experiments that really confirmed experimentally that uh, local realism is false. Uh, the, the idea that objects have definite values of properties like position and momentum and spin um, that exist even if they're not perceived, that, that's, that's local realism. Um, well, that's realism and locality is that the properties have influences that propagate no faster than the speed of light. That's the lo locality. Local realism is false. It, it, it just won the Nobel Prize. That's just false. In other words, to put it very, very bluntly, you know, brains are made of neurons, neurons are made of molecules, molecules are made of particles, right? Well, those particles have no definite values of any of their properties when they're not observed. They don't, they don't exist. Neither do the molecules, neither do the brains. Nothing, the, the, the whole reductionist paradigm falls apart. Re reductionism doesn't work. It, 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 reductionism is dead. And, and so it, it's also trying to, in the other metaphor we use, you know, there's the, the screen and then the movie on the screen. Well, it's like trying to take something in the movie and say that that created the whole screen. Well, no, that's just something in the movie. The screen is something entirely outside the movie and far, in some sense, far deeper than the movie. The movie is just a play of pixels, play of, of, of firing of pixels in, on the screen. The screen is this you know, infinitely more capacity. So, so we've got the whole thing turned around. You know, we're starting with brains and trying to build up consciousness, and, and it's just the other way around. I think that, again, my generation just has to die. Um, but the next generation or the generation after that, this is a, this is a tough one, so it may take a couple generations, will we'll really wrap themselves around we have to start with a model of consciousness, even though we know we can never get a final model of consciousness. We have to start with whatever model we can get and show how space-time arises and, and then show how brains arise um, from, from that model. Um, I'm working with, uh, I just submitted a proposal with Chetan Prakash and um, Shwapon Chaudhupandye. Um, <clears throat> he's a physicist where we're taking our model of consciousness, the conscious agents, and, and proposing specifically how mass, energy, momentum, and spin in space-time arise from the Markovian dynamics of conscious agents. In other words, we, we're, we're now saying here is a map from properties of consciousness to physical properties like spin, momentum, energy. Um, and, and so forth, but bound particles versus free particles versus confined particles. So we're, we're start, so if that kind of serious, specific, mathematically precise um, correspondence between conscious agent dynamics and physics succeeds in the next few years, then this may happen really quickly. You know, if we can actually, you know, solve problems that the current physics can't, we can, you know, explain, you know, why the fine structure constant in physics is, has the value it has and why it's ubiquitous um, from a theory that's beyond space-time, um, then I think there'll be, it'll, it'll just be almost overnight. That, that kind of thing could happen overnight. So, so wow. it'll all depend on what kind of successes we have. All you need is one killer app, right? One killer app and then the thing will take off. So, you know, with, with Einstein, um, there, there, was, there were several killer apps with his special theory of relativity and general relativity. But, you know, we, we found black holes. When you find black holes, okay, well, it doesn't mean that general relativity is, is correct, but it sure means you better take it seriously because no other theory predicted black holes. I mean, that, that's the one that predicts black holes, and they're there. So, so all of a sudden, you know, general relativity has a killer. Of course, the killer app early on was you know, the bending of light um, when – we took pictures of stars close to the sun. I mean, that was already a, a big killer app that, that, that general relativity gave us. But so all you need is a big killer app like that. And, and then this thing could, could take off. So that's what I and my team are focused on right now is trying to get the killer app where people go, okay, we can't do that in space time, but you can do that with conscious agents. Okay. Wow. Maybe we better start studying these conscious agents. And and it makes perfect sense that until there's a killer app, why should people take it seriously? So that's what sure. we're after. The killer okay. App. Okay. So you talk about killer app. So if this killer app does transpire and then all of a sudden we get it all across the news, you know, okay, listen, guys, breaking news, 
space and time are an illusion. Now, I, I'm sure you've noticed recently people are sort of fixated to some degree or there's been a bit more attention on the possibility of UFOs with, you know, the, the balloons flying over and all that kind of stuff, a lot of speculation about that. Now, I don't know about for you, but to me, um, space and time being an illusion is a bigger deal even than the discovery of UFOs. I don't know if you would agree with that. <laughs> Quite Absolutely. a lot bigger. Yeah, a, lot, a lot bigger. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 